try to do is communicate in a way that people, whether they have their PhDs or whether they're the nine-year-old boy, my son Landon sitting in the front pew, that everybody can get it. Right? Together, everyone? So don't try to sound highfalutin, but you don't have to be like, yo, what's up? I was like, I was thinking about this sermon, and I was like, whoa, you know, it's like, the Bible's heavy, you know, it's a lot of real heavy stuff up, up in here, you know what I'm saying? And what is that? What, what, what is that? Now, I don't care, you talk however you want when you're talking to me, but don't stand up, and, because here's the thing, if the purpose is to communicate, if you use idiosyncratic or, or language that is either too highfalutin or too common, you unnecessarily give people a reason to write you off. Does that make sense? And there's just, no, there's just no need for it. Speak in a way as to be understood. Okay? Speak in a way so as to be understood. Uh, practice difficult names beforehand. Watch the hearers to see if they're getting it. That's always a very good idea. Ellen White says, Jesus watched with deep earnestness. He watched with deep earnestness the changing faces, countenances of his hearers. The faces that expressed interest and pleasure gave him great satisfaction as the arrows of truth pierced to the soul, breaking through the barriers of selfishness and working contrition, and finally gratitude, the Savior was made glad when his eyes swept over the throng of listeners, and he recognized among them the faces he had uh, before seen, his countenance lighted up with joy, he saw in them hopeful subjects for his kingdom. When the truth, plainly spoken, touched some cherished idol, he marked the change. Notice, he watched, he swept, his eyes swept over, he marked the change of countenance, the cold forbidding look which told that the light was unwelcome. When he saw men refuse the message of peace, his heart was pierced to the very depths. So Jesus obviously is paying attention. Are the listeners getting it? It's astonishing to me how many preachers are well beyond the point where anybody is paying attention to them, and they just keep preaching away. They just keep preaching away. Listen, people say, what is the appropriate length for a sermon? And the answer is, as long as you can keep their attention. For some preachers, right, that's going to be 20 minutes. And you can preach a fantastic 20-minute sermon. For others, you can sit there and listen to them for more than an hour, and you, you do not lose them. You are focused on them. You're focused on the message. A sermon, you cannot say 45 minutes because some of us have heard 45-minute sermons that should have been done 20 minutes ago. Yes? But we've also heard 45-minute sermons that we would love to go on for another hour. Yes or no? So, so how, what's the appropriate length for a sermon? The answer is very simple. As long as you are actually retaining the attention of the people to whom you are communicating. Make sense? And for most of us, that time is shorter than we think. For most of us, that time is shorter than we think. You'd be far better off to preach a short sermon and have people think, man, I, I want him to preach again, or I want her to preach again, or I really enjoyed that sermon. I wish it were longer than to have them say, man, I wish that sermon were shorter. Better to leave them thirsty than to drown them. Together, everyone? Remember the statement? Your sermons would be twice as good, she said, if they were half as long, she said to a certain preacher. And so, in general, under, undersell your sermon. Undersell it. Better to give less information than more. Um, have one or two homiletical or theological hooks. Now, what we mean by that is, do I have an example here? Uh, no, I don't. Basically, what we mean by that is a homiletical hook is a repeated phrase or phrases that will help the sermon, the purpose of the sermon, to stick in the minds of the people. Okay? Um, Let's talk first about a homiletical hook. Can anybody here remember a sermon that they've heard that had a consistent phrase or phrases that were repeated in that sermon that has helped you all the way till today to still remember that sermon? Nihilus, what's one? <laughs> it was a, I don't even know if he was a pastor. We were on tour in South Africa, and uh, I think he was just an elder, and he spoke about <coughs> your altar, coming back to your altar where you met God the first time, or not just the first time, but where you keep on meeting him, um, where he brings you to your knees and shows you he's, in, he's still in charge. So the homiletical hook was the altar? Yes, he keeps on. Coming back to your altar. Yes. Exactly. And you remember that sermon today? Yes. Great. Anybody else? Randy Skeet. Okay, Randy Skeet. What did he, what did he say? What was... It's just, it's in there, it's assuming that God, God and all the chances he gives people. 
Was there a particular phrase that you can remember, Ozzy? Basically, always said, you know, remember we're sitting sumi. So sumi. You'll never have Oh, sumi. That's right. Okay, that's right. I've, I've seen that sermon. Yes. So sumi. Very good. Henry? Lytotes. Yeah, lytotes. Okay. For the lytotes. That's something that you remembered. Very good. So, Charlene, you got one? Keep getting up. Yeah, keep getting up. It's a great one. Yeah, keep getting up. Keep getting up. That sticks in your mind. Even if you don't remember all the verses, you remember the sermon. Very good. Andrew? A typical settled pastor. A typical settled pastor. Okay, so that was a part of his seminar. Part of a typical settled pastor. So that stuck in your mind. Great. Anybody else? One that really stuck with you? The neurological pathways. Okay, the neurological pathways was repeated. Has, uh, do we all know who C.D. Brooks is? Yes. Has anyone here heard his sermon, uh, Fictions of God? That's probably my favorite sermon ever preached that I've heard. He just has this great... He just has this great line that he just repeats over and over again. These are fictions of God. This isn't the real God. These are fictions of God. These are fictions of God. And that sermon has stuck with me to this day. Fictions of God. And so that's what we talk about when we talk about if, if it's possible, try and, and find some homiletical hook, something that's brief that will help your hearers to remember what the sermon is about. Fictions of God. Keep getting up. Has anyone here ever heard my sermon, Do? Okay, so when you, when you have the punchline is, apart from a saving relationship with Christ, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, all of our do is do-do, right? That's what he says, all of our do is do-do. Well, people remember that. People are going to remember that. Did Pastor Ashrick just say do-do from the front? Yes, he did. All of your do is do-do, okay? Several years ago at the GYC, I preached a sermon on uh, because of those who sat. And so that's the, that's the hook. Because of those who sat. Many of you are living your lives because of those who sat. Because of those who sat. Because of those who sat. And so, in your sermon that you're preparing coming up, try to find a homiletical phrase or phrases, a hook that you can, that, that even if people don't remember. I can tell you right now, there are numerous sermons. Ten years we've been training people at Arise. There are numerous sermons that I can recall that students have preached. Numerous sermons. Some, I have heard some of the most powerful heart-touching, life-changing sermons preached from, from you, from students. And almost all of them have some hook. Something that just, it's just in me, it'll be in me till the day I die. Something that I remember. One I remember was, the bush is burning again. They preached on, on Moses at the burning bush and told the story. And then they, then they, as they were closing the sermon, toward the latter half of the sermon, just again and again, friends, the bush is burning again. The bush is burning again. God is calling you. That bush, it's burning again. It's just stuck with me. When I read that passage now, when I read Exodus 3 now, man, I hear, I hear what that person said. The bush is burning again. It's, it's in my mind. It's not going anywhere. I mean, listen, think of pop songs, right? All of these, you know, ridiculous pop songs, they all have catchy lines, catchy beats, and catchy melodies, and they get stuck in your head. In fact, and sometimes they get stuck in your head in such a way that you remember them and you wish you didn't. Okay, well, you can use that as a case in point. You may say everything that's right, but if you give them a hook, something to remember the sermon by, you've done yourself a great service because you see them on Wednesday, you see them on Thursday, you see them a week later, two weeks later, and you say to them, what were the five texts I used in that sermon? They may not be able to remember, but you say, what was the sermon about? Oh, keep getting up. They got it. They may not remember Proverbs 24, 16. They may not remember Luke 5, 38 and onward, but they remember, keep getting up. Okay? That's what we mean by homiletical hook. Okay? Now, the same is true with a theological hook. What we mean by a theological hook is one or two points, usually, sometimes one, sometimes two, that is the, the real hook of the sermon, something that they will remember, and then you tie it to the homiletical hook. So, for example, apart from a saving relationship with Christ, all of your do is do-do, Philippians chapter 3. Keep getting up. That's straight out of Proverbs 24, 16. A just man falls 20... Uh, just man falls uh, seven times and rises up again. So you have those homiletical hooks and you tie them to some Bible. Some bi you say, well, that sounds like that would take a little bit of work. Yeah. Yeah, it will. To figure out what your picture is, what's the main point you're trying to bring out of the picture, or points, right? Your cow and your fence. And then what's the language you can use to help them to remember where the cow is? The cow is by the creek. The cow is by the creek. 
The cow is by the creek. Whatever that is, that, that language that you use, have it be, it's either succinct or it's, you use alliteration or there is some clever word. Uh, for example, I preached in that sermon I preached on, um, and it just came to my mind, that because of those who sat, I tried to tie the whole sermon to this juxtaposition of two words, this contraction of two words, God and audience. And I talked about how many people are living their lives for those who sat, the audience, but the reality is, is that we should live our lives for an audience of one, and that audience is God. And I said, you can take these two words and you can put them together. We live our lives for the Godians. God is our audience, the only audience that we should care about. Boom, that's in the mind. It's in the mind now. That's easy to remember. Godians. The moment you hear that, you remember the whole sermon. God is my audience. I'm going to live for him, not for those who sat. Making sense? Okay, so that's what we mean by homiletical theological hook. And then finally, make a clear, reasonable, and personal appeal, which we'll come back to in just a moment, okay? The appeal should be personable. It should be reasonable. In other words, it should flow out of the sermon, and uh, it should be clear. In other words, whatever it is that you're asking the people to do, and some, some appeals are very good and some appeals are very bad. Usually, you have weak appeals at the end of long sermons because preachers start to feel conscientious about how long they've gone, and they don't take the time to put in the extra time for the appeal, Okay? So sometimes appeals are, are weak, and the, the appeal is just, if you want to serve God, stand and sing the closing hymn with me. Well, people are going to stand and sing the closing hymn no matter what. I mean, can you imagine somebody being like, I'm not going to serve God. I'm going to stay sitting through this whole closing hymn. No, <laughs> that's, a, that's a situation where you basically are, you've trained them to respond, but their response is a non-response. That's not a, I mean, stand and sing the closing hymn with me. I mean, they're going to stand and sing the closing hymn no matter what. So that's basically training people to make non-consequential decisions at the, ends of, at the ends of sermons. So better to preach a shorter sermon and really be able to spend some time on the appeal. Whether that appeal is coming to the altar, which is appropriate, whether that appeal is raising your hand, whether that appeal is, appeal is getting in groups of two and praying together, kneeling and praying together, uh, whatever the appeal is, it should be reasonable and it should flow logically out of the sermon, whatever the sermon is that you've preached. Make sense, everyone? Okay, so those are some do's, and we'll take one break and we'll come back for our last session, which won't be very long, probably.